aren't y'all thankful that God has led Ernie and Rose to serve in this position as our interim senior adult pastor? It's been my, our offices are right next to each other, and uh, it's been my privilege to know him and as they serve here at our church, and uh, I'm just thankful that the Lord has led at this time for that to be what he's doing and helping our church, and helping all the people that I'm looking at right now and others that are not here with us today as well. Uh, so let me go over the schedule for Betty's service. There's going to be a Saturday visitation at Betty's house from 5 to 7. I just talked to Shannon as I was driving in this morning, and we're going to talk again tomorrow and finalize some more about the funeral. But there's going to be the, the visitation at the home on Saturday, and then Monday at 10 o'clock, viewing will be here in the LMA, and the service will be at 11, Pastor Heath, myself, and another pastor that's from North Carolina, that's her uh, brother-in-law, are going to be doing the service, and then there will be a burial after the service, and it's a private family burial, so you'll understand that, but that will give you several opportunities to talk to Shannon and her husband, and then their their son, Garrett, and the two daughters, Gabriella and Grace, I believe, are both of their names. Um, so how many of y'all knew Betty? <laughs> Laurie and I have been privileged to serve our church for 28 years, and uh, we loved Betty and Bill um, back in one of my... Um, hospitalizations out of the many that I've had. Um, the night before I was to have a surgery the next day, Sunday night, uh, about 4.30, um, Bill and Betty came walking in my hospital room and prayed for me. And I'm so thankful. Uh, they were, I was the education pastor at that time. I've been lots of different things down through all these years. But they were there to pray for me, and I have always been thankful for her and for Bill, both. They're, they're wonderful people of God. Uh, they, they stopped there at the Baptist Hospital downtown to pray with me, and they came on over here to do CLU, the class that she was leading. So that's the way she is. She's always been faithful to our church and we have a, a treasure in the memory of Betty Saunders, and I hope that you'll honor that uh, this week. Um, so Laurie and I came here 28 years ago to do music. I was on music staff back in those days for four years, and then moved over to education staff and stayed there till about 17 or 18, and then joined Ernie in the counseling ministry. So my actual title is Pastor of Care and Discipleship. And you might say, well, what in the world does that mean? And it's sort of a little evasive, I would have to admit. So here's the things that I do. I do hospitals ministry. I go to the hospital a lot and see people there. Myself, I don't go see myself, but I go see other people. Other people come and see me. Uh, then I do funerals. Um, the prison and jail ministry. So I am the only one that can get into our local Duval County jail to see people. So if you know somebody that needs a visit in the jail, I'd be the one to contact about that. Uh, I lead our prison ministry. Our church ministers um, at two state prisons. Both are over in like Union County, and I don't remember the name of the other county. But they're actually back up to each other. Baker, well, Baker's not it, I don't think. But Stark and, um, and Union Correctional are the two that we go to Monday nights and Thursday nights each week. Um, and we have a great ministry at both of those prisons. I do biblical counseling. So I see uh, some men or couples about the counseling issues that they are facing. Now, I'm also the new lead teacher in the Senior Adult Couple Ones class. And are any of y'all in our class? I see several of y'all. Yeah, okay. So we've got several of y'all there in our class. And that's a joy, too. I started doing that the 1st of February. 
And I'm just really, really thankful to be leading that class. So we meet in uh, this building on in room 221. Um, so that's basically what I do. We have two children. Caleb, our son, is 35. He's going to be 35 in October. I can't believe that. And um, they go to Fruit Cove, he and his wife, and he teaches the Sunday school class out at Fruit Cove. And so I'm really, really proud of him for his walk with Jesus and he loves the Lord so very much. And then our daughter, Sarah, and her husband live in Green Cove Springs, and they're doing great. She's 20. She's going to be 27, I guess. And so uh, there's eight years difference in their two ages, whatever that makes her. But anyways, she's doing very great as well, and we're thankful for both of our children and for getting to spend time with them. We have no grandchildren yet. But Drake and Sarah have four grand dogs. <laughs> and I'm talking about big, like this big dogs. And so last weekend, not this Sunday, but the previous Sunday, from Wednesday till Sunday night, Laurie and I kept the dogs. And we had to go to their house to keep them. And so we stayed there on Saturday night. And then I had to teach our class, those of y'all are over here, I taught our class Sunday, and I was like, okay, eyes, stay propped open because the dogs kept us up all night long the previous night. So, you know, I, I've, I say this, that when we have children, God lets us have children when we're younger, and, not, and that's good that we don't have them when we're our age now, but dogs do the same thing, I think. Um, I don't think I could take care of dogs all night long anymore, so at this point in my life. All right, so, and I wanted to mention one other thing. Ernie wrote a material called Grief Care. We had the pilot teaching of it eight weeks last fall, and so it will start on April the 10th, on Wednesday night at 6.15, and I'll teach it again. And so this time, it's going to be 6.15 to 7.15. This time of the year, it's, it's light till after 8 o'clock. So you could come, participate, and if you have been through grief in the last few years, I would encourage you to go through it. We found it to be very helpful. He wrote the material, and I teach it. So um, if you would like to more information about that, I think they've got cards that they're giving out with our number, either in the pastoral care office or my business card. You can call either number. It's a different number. But call either number if you need any more information. But that will be on Wednesday night, April the 10th, starting at 6.15. We'd love for you to join us. Okay, I guess that's all of the time that I have to talk about what's going on. And uh, we're going to turn to Psalm 11 together today. Hopefully you've read Psalm 11. Have you read it? All right, good. Well, let me, add, let me start out this way. And by the way, I, I like to teach with interaction. So when I ask a question, I'm really asking a question. It's not just a thought. So if you have an answer, you can answer it out and it'll be fine. I have hearing aids, so probably I can hear you either way. And I've got this microphone, so you should be able to hear me. Uh, what's been the scariest time you've ever had where you were tempted to hide your head in the sand? You ever felt like hiding your head in the sand? How many of you have faced physical challenges with your body that you thought, I'm, I'm just not going to go to the doctor. I just don't even want to do anything about this. I don't know what to do. And so you've been sort of scared. Maybe you've had kids that your kids have sort of gone the wrong direction and you just hid your head in the sand because you didn't know what to do. And so we're tempted to do that, aren't we? In our world, today's psalm is written to express the confidence that the faithful people can have even when we face a severe time of crisis in our lives. Have you ever read Psalm 46? I know we're not doing that one today. Have you ever read Psalm 46? What does he say? He tells us about the first three verses. He tells us about some really cataclysmic events in life, like mountains are tumbling down on top of us. So just think, the Smoky Mountains come crashing down all the way. That'd be a long way, I know, 
but they come crashing down on the whole east coast of America, and we get smashed under all that rock. And then the ocean, the next verse says, comes up over the mountains, and then we get drowned. Now, that's pretty cataclysmic, isn't it? Getting smashed under rocks and then drowned with water. But does anybody know what God says in Psalm 46, verse 10? Be still still and know or acknowledge, agree with, say that, that I am God. I will be exalted, right? So God... I know that a lot of things in my life are around doctors. So God gives us a prescription to take care of the anxiety that we're facing in that verse, Psalm 46.10. And what is what about a prescription? Does it do you any good to go down to Walgreens and have it filled and then sit it up on a, bo- on a shelf and look at it? No. That doesn't help, does it? Or the only, if they say, take this for 10 days, twice a day, and you sit it there and you go ahead and take one and say, well, you know what? I took one. That's probably all good enough. Is that going to work? No. They gave you a prescription because you need to do what it says. And so just keep that in mind. Now, let's look at Psalm 11 and see what we're not supposed to hide in fear. So let's read verse 1. To the choir master of David, In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, Flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot it in the dark and upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. His eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. So David here in verse 1 is saying that he was advised to leave Jerusalem and to flee to the mountains. Uh, but you can run away from your problems, but you know what? Whenever you get wherever you're going, the problems are going to be there. They're not going to just leave you. Have you ever had friends like David's here or Job's friends over the book of Job who advised you to run away from your problems? Anybody ever had friends like that? Well, it's not a good advice, is it? He mentions here in this first verse that the the wings of a dove. But David really needed a different set of wings to rely on. A dove's a little bitty bird, right? Its wings are not very big. But what about the wings of an eagle that soar? That's right. So he needed God's wings. He needed God to come along beside of him. We can attempt to put our trust in the wrong things when problems come. And anything that's in opposition to the Word of God that you're putting your trust in is the wrong set of wings to trust in. And so we need to determine that right up front. And so what does the enemy do? So we see in the first verse what David should do. Now, what does the enemy do in the second verse? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot it in the dark at the upright in heart. So the wicked are threatening to kill the upright. I was coming in today and uh, had been actually visiting a hospital, and I was listening to Fox News on my Sirius radio, and they were talking about some court somewhere. I don't, I don't ever quite get all the story um, in my brain because I'm trying to do too many things at one time. But they were talking about some court that was going to rule, I think today, about an abortion pill. Now, in our world... 
That's a big deal in our day, abortion. Now, I'm thankful that 61, 62 years ago when I was born, that Roe versus Wade hadn't gotten started because I'm the product of a guy and a girl that were not married, that had sex and had a baby. She had the baby. And he took me and gave me away the next day. Praise God he did because I got adopted at five months old and got raised by parents and that loved me and met my every need. They were super parents. They're both in heaven now, but they were super parents. And I'm so thankful for my parents. But just think about all the little children. They said on this story that I heard on Fox News today that this pill would cause the mom to abort the baby up to 13 weeks of gestation. This pill that they would take would cause her to have an abortion all the way up to 13 weeks. Now think about that. Did you know that baby's heart is already beating? inside of that mother, and she's going to take this pill, and it's going to cause that baby to die and to be expelled from her body, but that's what our world does. The wicked are threatening to kill the upright. That's just one example of it, but when we go back to verse 1, we read that he said, how can you say in that verse to my soul, This was David's way of saying the natural reaction to calamity is this. And the natural reaction, the human reaction that we have to dealing with wanting to bury our heads in the sand is not always right. So it's always good to know the facts when you're considering the presence and the promises of God. You need to find out the facts. When you're facing decisions in life, when you're facing physical decisions about your body, you need to find out the facts. Don't bury your head in the sand. Find the facts. Dwell on the facts in life. And then let's look at verse 3. Because what can the righteous do? If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, David was the king of Israel. And anything that came after him would come against the kingdom of Israel. Society today is built on truth, but nobody knows where the truth is. Right? Our nation was built on this. People don't want to hear that today. But much of our law is built upon the Word of God, and that is where truth. Isaiah 59 says this, beginning in verse 11. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities, transgressing and denying the Lord, and turning back from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away. Now listen to this. For truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking. And he who departs from evil makes himself prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. Don't you imagine that God would like there to be a whole lot more justice in our world, in our nation today, in the way that we deal with each other? You know, God sometimes allows cataclysmic things in our lives so that we're turned to him in faith and trust. I know that Pastor Heath has had that in his own with all these brain surgeries he's gone through. It's helped him to grow in his faith and trust in the Lord. I hope that you know that's been true in my life with all the the, uh, things that have come my way, you know, and I would just say this because I'm I'm looking back at him drinking that coffee, and I know that coffee is good. (laughs) Ernie and I worked at that time over in the counseling office together, 
And so I'd had the test to find out if, if I had cancer or not. And I'm sitting there eating my lunch in our little bar that we had there. And he was heating up some lunch or getting a Coke or something out of the refrigerator. And I, my phone rang. And I answered it. And it was the doctor calling me to tell me that I had cancer and that I had to do something about it. And Ernie did exactly what he should have done. He didn't, he didn't hear what the doctor was saying, but he knew from my conversation over the phone that I'd just gotten bad news. And he came up behind, beside me, put his arm around my shoulder, and just started praying for me. And then when I hung up, he said, I know that you've gotten some bad news. Let's pray about this. And we prayed together. And that's a great brother who was right there for me in the moment that I definitely needed him. And I just remembered that, so I wanted to share that. Um, This passage is a reminder that we're all called upon to lay the foundations of truth and justice for the generation that's coming behind us. Now, I don't have grandchildren. I have children, but I don't have grandchildren. But I'm looking at a room full of people that have probably lots of grandchildren, right? Right? And the generation that's coming after us, those children and grandchildren, need our faithfulness lived out in front of them. You know, that's one of the things about Betty Saunders that made her such a special lady. There's lots of people that Betty affected for the good, for gospel, for Jesus Christ. And we need to do the same thing. We need to invest our lives at this station that we find ourselves at. We're not dead, right? I mean, I'm looking at a room full of people that are breathing and living. We might be slower than some other people, but that's okay, right? So, I mean, right now, when I was 40, I could go to hospitals and do all kinds of stuff, and I was fast. I'm a little slower now. So I have to advance and have to make choices, you know, and you can't do everything. But, but I could still serve the Lord. And so uh, just remember that. Don't, don't quit. Don't give up. Don't, don't turn it in, okay? The people that are coming after us, the younger generations, need our wisdom and our gracious attitude as we ste- seek to steer them to follow Jesus with their whole heart. And so what God will do, verses 4 through 7, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes and his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, and his, he loves righteous deeds, upright shall behold his face. So when the outlook is grim, try the uplook. Look to God. Keep your focus on him. Philippians 4, 8 through 9 says it so wonderfully. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think or dwell about or on these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I will tell you this. When when trials come, when bad things come your way, the tendency within us as humans is to be negative and to see the bad things, to see the, to think bad thoughts about what we're facing. God doesn't want us to do that. And we have to do, this scripture has helped me more than any other scripture when I says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, ask yourself truth. What truth is in this? Don't start thinking everything that's bad. Tell yourself truth as you deal with us. Because our tendency is to dwell on the problems and the bad situations. And David says it here. In the Lord have I put my trust. Have you done that? 
Hopefully you will. Hopefully you have. He knew that God was the one who was on the throne in his holy temple. And he goes on and he tells us, and I'm going to cut through some of this um, in the interest of time, but uh, the Lord tests the righteous, and we have to trust in the Lord in the difficulties of our lives. Uh, let me read this, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 18. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed, right? Aren't you glad about that? We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but we're not forsaken. Struck down, but we're not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written. I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you in his presence. So it's God who's going to work in us and through us in all the days of our life. And if you're still breathing, and it looks like everybody still is, keep your focus on that, not on the problem. What does God have planned for his own people? It says that the upright will behold his face. Seeing face to face means that you're in a personal relationship with God and you have access to him. So when Jesus returns, those who are not his will be cast away from his presence. But right now, they still have an opportunity to come to him and they need to come to him and trust in him. And you know, all of this psalm is really based upon the fact that we have a personal relationship with our Savior and Lord, the risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to remind you this morning of, about that, about the Lord Jesus Christ. Because this is the week that we're going to celebrate, and I'm so thankful that Ernie went through all of that this morning. We're celebrating the fact that Jesus came, he lived, he died, he was buried, he was resurrected. Aren't you glad he resurrected? Amen. Amen. And Jesus was born of a virgin. Now, I told the guys out at prison last night, it's really important that Jesus was born of a virgin because all of us, because of Adam and Eve's sin, we are all inherited sinners. So the Bible tells us that when we were inside of our mother's womb, we were a sinner even then. So we didn't have to get born and steal a piece of candy or take a dollar out of our mother's purse and go to the store or whatever. We didn't have to do that to become a sinner. We were already a sinner while we were inside of our mom. And we were born sinners. But Jesus had no earthly father. He had a stepfather, but he didn't have an earthly father. He had a heavenly father. So he had no inherited sin. And then he lived for 33 years here on this earth. And he never sinned in 33 years. So he was uniquely prepared. He was the only one who could have paid the price for your sin and my sin. By dying on the cross. I couldn't die for Kenny. Kenny couldn't die for me. We both have our own sin that would have to have been paid for. But Jesus had no sin. Don't you understand how important that that is? And the liberals have tried to steal that from us and say, well, you know, the first five chapters of Genesis are not true. They're all myths. And the first 11 chapters are, are myth. No, that's not. That's not true. And Jesus was born of a virgin. The Bible says so, and we believe it. We believe what the Bible says. And so that is the truth. 
He was crucified for our sins. And on the third day, he had been buried and he rose from the dead. He actually rose from the dead. How did he get out of the grave? He came out. He rose. Did the angel have to roll the tomb, the stone away from the door so that he could get out? Did the angel keep him in there for a while? No. He came out. It was like he walked through walls later on. He came out of the grave. The angel rolled the stone away so we could see in to see he wasn't in there any longer. But he didn't let him out. Jesus came out. He has paid in full our debt of sin. You don't, you don't have to do things to get saved. You do things because you are saved. So we, we serve Jesus today because we are saved. We're not trying to get saved. There's nothing you can add to his grace. It's been paid in full. And what we have to do is trust Jesus because we can't get right on our own. So I want you to keep that in mind. We need to repent. Now, what does it mean to repent? If I'm going this way and I repent, it means I turn around and I go the other way, away from the sin that I was pursuing, right? We turn around, we repent, and we place our faith in him. The Bible says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we don't even have the faith we need to be saved. God has to give it to us so we can, again, invest it into him. Place our faith in him alone for salvation. So I know that you're all older. And that's good. We're all, we're all in this together, right? But you know what? If we haven't trusted Jesus, it doesn't matter if we're 95, 103, 52, 39, whatever, 19. If we haven't trusted Jesus and we're not walking with him, we need to do that. So I just want to challenge you today to really examine your own life and to think about the truths of that. Are you walking with Jesus today? If not, Man, this would be a great day to begin walking with Jesus. All right, let's, let's see. Now, I don't pray right now. I pray in a minute, right? I'll pray right now. Is this when I pray to bless the food? No. I, hey, listen, after you've been put to sleep 28 times for having surgeries, it's like your brain just sort of goes, ah, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. All right, let me pray. Jesus, we love you. And I thank you for today and for the time that you've given us to enjoy one another and to enjoy your word and to think about how that you don't want us to bury our heads in the sand. You want us to serve you, to serve other people, and do that faithfully. Now, bless our time the rest of this day as we gather together in this food in a little bit. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Okay, I'm going to do a little ad for Steve here. Uh, back on my table, I have pastoral care cards that tell you how to get a hold of them in case of a death or an illness. So please take advantage of those and take them in. If you actually have to need to get a hold of Steve, I also have his business cards back there on my table. So please do that. Okay. Who's had a birthday or who's having a birthday this week? 
Viv, having a birthday. Look, we decorated for you. <laughs> Linda, yeah, I saw a hand go back up out here somewhere. Who? Charles, okay. Anybody else? Okay, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Oh, okay. Now, anybody had an anniversary this week? No anniversaries? Well, we'll do that next week. <laughs> okay, I think Linda wants to make some instructions. <laughs> Quickly, wanted to recognize some friends from the Nocatee campus that came up here uh, today. So thank you for coming. They're way back in the back there. So guys, wave, <laughs> including... Pastor Spencer's in-laws, so it's really nice to have them here. So thank you for coming. I hope you're staying for lunch in the party. <laughs> oh, okay, ready for the spring fling. You need your yellow ticket to get your ticket to help you win the grand prize. So as you go through line, you'll exchange your yellow ticket for a smaller ticket that we will use for the drawing and you will get a chocolate bunny, but that's just the beginning of the bunnies. Um, okay, everybody clear on that? You're gonna get a game on your table while you're gone. That is a, it's a challenging brain teaser game. And uh, some of you will be more challenged than others. And who the table wins if you identify all the things that we're looking for and I think it's tomorrow that's Marilyn Kirkpatrick's birthday. And so I don't she's not technically a senior, so we can't really acknowledge her. Okay. Now you play the electric. All right, now let's pray. Dear Jesus, how we thank you for today and thank you for all these wonderful people you have gathered here. And I pray your blessings upon this food. I pray that you will use it to strengthen our bodies, and that you'll use the word that we've just studied to strengthen our souls, and that you'll help us to live lives that glorify and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.